Welcome, I'm Benedict de Monor, the CEO of World Monuments Fund, and it's my pleasure to welcome you for this third event in our Heritage Now series, exploring the nexus between cultural heritage and contemporary events and politics. Today, we are discussing the future of Venice and the many threats the city is facing. With more than 20 million visitors a year, Venice is one of the most popular touristic destinations in the world. And it's not a surprise as Venice is truly one of the most extraordinary sites and places that humanity has created. At the same time, we all know that Venice is living on borrowed times. The city is threatened as a residential community by the number of tourists it attracts every year chasing away its inhabitants. And it's even more threatened by the rising sea levels caused by climate change. These challenges are not new, but the unique circumstances of this year, of this pandemic, have given us an occasion to pause and to reflect about our responsibility towards this irreplaceable heritage. Many interesting things happened this year, and there are some silver lining. For a fact, for instance, you know, like five to six times a week, some gigantic cruise ships were crossing over the historic center of Venice, carrying thousands of passengers. And this has stopped. The water is cleaner. And just this week, I've heard that two dolphins were seen in the canals, which is quite extraordinary. Measures are being announced, and there is a growing awareness of the fact that things need to, need to be done for tourists to be done in a different way. Another historic event that happened this year in 2020 was the activation of the Mosi barrier. And for those of you who don't know what Mosi is, this is a system of barriers that is designed to prevent the flood that is happening very regularly. And in fact, with a dramatic increase over the last decades uh, because of the increase of high tides events. So this year, after many discussions and many years of debate, the MOSI has been activated. Each flood is devastating to Venice cultural heritage, causing millions of damage. I don't know if you remember, but right before the pandemic in November 2019, Venice was flooded with one of the worst floods in history, with 80% of the city covered in water. As an example, the damages to St. Mark's Basilica are estimated to 5 million euros. So this is a good news that this year, on several occasions, Mosi was able to contain the water. What's concerning is that several times he was not able to do so. So bearing these challenges in mind, it is time to ask us the question, when we are seeing that the end of the pandemic is, is in sight with the vaccinations plan rolling out, Are we going to resume travel and tourism in the same way that it was before? Are we able to go back? Are we going to be able to go back to Venice and shall we? And if we do so, how can we do it in a responsible manner? How can we enjoy the marvels of Venice while protecting them and making sure that they are, pre that they are preserved for future generations? So to answer this important question, I am joined by three great speakers. So Jane D'Amosto is an environmental scientist from Venice, and she's the executive director of the NGO We Are Here Venice, a nonprofit association that addresses Venice challenges as a living city. Thomas Saraceno is a visual artist and activist whose work constantly questions our rapport with our environment. His installation at the 2019 Venice Biennale, which we will discuss later today, directly tackled the question of Venice threatened by rising sea levels. And finally, David Lando, scholar, curator, and philanthropist, is an active resident of Venice, and he published in September in the arts newspaper a five-point plan raising awareness of the various challenges facing Venice. He is also leading the effort to preserve 
the synagogue renaissance in the Jewish ghetto in Venice and partnering with World Monuments Fund to do so. So thank you so much, uh, Jane, Thomas, and David for joining us today. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Save Venice, our partner for this event. And before we begin, I'd like also to mention that we are going to have a Q&A at the end of this event. So please submit your question in the chat and we'll try to go through as many of them as possible at the end of the discussion. Thank you. So maybe to, to start the discussion, I would like the three of you to transport us to Venice. Uh, can you uh, tell us about a monument in Venice or a site that is meaningful to you, a place where uh, you earn, a place that you earn to see when you are not in Venice and that makes you want to come back? So maybe I will start with you, Jane. What is your place in Venice? Well, I immediately thought of the statue of Bartolomeo Colleoni that was in fact restored by the World Monuments Fund. And I often think of it because it's very close to the place where I work. It's, um, it's a fun thing because right um, every afternoon it becomes a children's playground and the statue is literally a climbing frame for the children. Following the tragic flood of 2019, the railings around the statue became a place for people to dry their carpets. And then most recently, last summer, there was a peaceful, silent protest organized by a new civic movement for, against the touristification of Venice called Asterisco. And they have this wonderful motto that is, niente cambia, Se non cambi niente. It means nothing changes if you don't change anything. So the statue represents for me the unique way that Venetian cultural heritage and Venetians themselves coexist in a pragmatic and mutually enriching way. Thank you, Jane. Uh, that's wonderful. And, and David, can you transport us to your place in Venice? Well, you will not be surprised that my place is the Venetian Renaissance synagogues. Um, they are the most beautiful um, Renaissance synagogues anywhere in the world. Um, they are unique because there are a number of them, and they are what can be called a hidden treasure. And you can see what exactly what I mean in this slide, a hidden treasure, because that thing, you know, Venice is full of cupolas. Every church has a magnificent cupola and started from some marks down. And, uh, and this is the little cupola of one of these hidden synagogues, Renaissance synagogues of Venice. There are three of them particularly that I'm concerned with. They occupy a corner of, uh, of the Ghetto Nuovo, the Campo de Ghetto Nuovo, the big square where uh, inside the ghetto. And um, they are hidden because they had to be hidden because officially they never existed. When they were built, and this one was built in 1532, uh, Jews were not allowed to have synagogues. So what they did, they pretended they didn't have them, and the state, who obviously knew well that they did, pretended not to see that this was not a normal room, um, not a bathroom with a cupola on top, but it was obviously a, 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 a place of prayer. If you see the next slide, I can, you can imagine being inside it. This is exactly under that little cupola, and you can see the well, the richness of the decoration and the beauty of this synagogue built in 1532. And, um, but obviously this um, beautiful photograph hides the real state of these synagogues. They are in reality in very bad condition and uh, perhaps we'll come back to that later, but this is the place where, which is in my heart and which I want to see completely restored to its magnificence. Thank you, David. And, and Thomas, what is the place that you yearn to see in Venice? No, you're silent. There we are. Yeah, thank you, Benedict. Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, no, I thought in one moment, uh, for me, always what is making it so particular Venice is the water. No, it's this really being a, a city which. Uh, which you, you, you almost walk on the water no? and you cross everywhere. And this means I discovered recently 
when I was participating on the one of the last Biennale, I was going from the place where I was sleeping back to Arsenale, which is a military zone, which needed a little bit of special permission to enter with a kayak. And I will go back and forth. And, and then I was diving in a little bit about uh, who is using the water. It was so beautiful in your, your introduction, uh, thinking now that dolphin also will come back to Venice. This has been when we think about uh, we will will we come back to Venice is always who is coming back to Venice and what could become a monument in that extent and this mean can we think about uh, the water as a as a moment monument and in this case uh, at which level uh, will become a monument or a threat and in that extent also with the image as I've seen uh, was also a monument not only water on on, on the as we know it in the in a liquid state, but also on the disappearance of cloud, which is the piece on the right. This mean also on the clouds, right? And in the clouds, which I will be also talking today, is mostly about um, the digital sphere also. And this mean as much as we can control and mon monumentalize certain levels uh, today, mobile phones and waves, not only aquatic, are in the air. It's been, it will be quite interesting for me to try to weave these um, invisible threats, let's put it that way, that could become uh, dangerous or not if we don't uh, start to look more carefully. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for transporting us so, so, so poetically uh, to Venice. And uh, I think... David um, is amazing. Yeah, yeah <laughs> David, do you want to say I saw, something? I saw a comment in the chat saying, uh, no, those two dolphins were not real. They were um, a kind of computer generated, well, they were real. They were absolutely real. This time, throughout the, the lockdown last time, they were all made up on computers, they were computer generated. But this time, they were real. There were two dolphins, and they were seen by, by people who, in the know, they were seen by dozens of people, but particularly by the director of the, of the uh, um, Museum of Natural History here, and by a team that came especially from Padua, to bring them back to, to the Adriatic from here so that they wouldn't get lost in the little canals of Venice, but they were real. No, but thank you, thank you, David, because I also thought it was a scam initially, but apparently it was really true. And, 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 and thank you to the three of you for transporting us to this extraordinary place. I must also say that for World Monuments Fund, Venice it plays a special role because this is where we were born. We started our first projects uh, after the 1966 flood uh, in Venice, and we since then completed 33 projects there. And, and Venice is truly an emblem for cultural heritage preservation because it's, I think it's after this 1966 flood that there was the first international campaign for monument. So Venice is a perfect illustration of the fact that it's not only the responsibility of the local population to preserve their local heritage, but it's also the responsibility of humanity. And I think in Venice, we have the possibility to, to have a laboratory to really experiment solutions to the way to mitigate climate change and to manage better tourism that will be then useful for the rest of the world. So maybe Jane, as you are an environmental scientist to set the stage, can you explain to us how climate change um, you know, threatens the lagoon and how urgent this situation is? And is it, um, how does uh, over tourism interact with that? Is there a, a connection between the two elements? Well, it is indeed urgent, but before answering your questions, I just want to quickly give a little more background to We Are Here Venice, the NGO that I co-founded co five years ago. We're a small transdisciplinary group of activists and our mission is to protect the future of Venice. And by trying to ensure that it remains a living city. We mean it has to be a place that hosts a diversity of productive activities, jobs, housing for different kinds of families with all kinds of professions, lifestyles, levels of income, community services, entertainments, of which tourism will remain an inevitable part of the equation, but it cannot be the dominant raison d'etre of Venice we are advocating for balance. And this encompasses most of all our relationship to the lagoon, the protection of which is essential to the health of the city. And I don't want anybody to forget this ever. And considering the question of climate change, sea level rise 
will undoubtedly submerge Venice if nothing is done. We're already addressing the effects of the climate crisis that is underway. To help us understand the issues, we've now started a project with the Bangladesh community in Venice. It's the largest non-Italian portion of the population. And as well as their integration issues in Venice, many of these people are already climate refugees and they have a lot of insights to share with us. Average water level is already 30 centimeters higher than it was a century ago. So anyone who comes to Venice will have seen that most of the steps you know, on the water entrances to palaces are already green with algae. In the, in the squares of Venice, the wells have lost all their architectural features because ground levels have been raised. And we also have to add that all new data about sea level rise is coming in at the upper end of the scenarios. And so it's reasonable to predict that the current predictions will be exceeded in reality. And this is the preamble to say that recognizing Venice as a beacon of humanity, going back to all that goes on on top of and around the horse statue that I talked about at the beginning, is we need to accommodate these interconnections between the living city and the lagoon in the way that it adapts to sea level rise. And this means explicit reconciliation of the different economic interests in Venice. People are still in denial about the really hard choices that need to be made now. What is it of Venice that must be conserved? And how do we want to save Venice? It cannot continue to have giant ships coming across the lagoon if the lagoon is going to be part of the Venice that we want to save. We're here to promote a new economic model for the whole city that re will reduce its, dependent on, its dependence on tourism and reposition the natural capital of the lagoon as a potential provider of wealth and jobs, as well as showing that the salt marsh is actually able to help us mitigate climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide even more efficiently than forests. So what you're saying is that because of climate change, that salt marshes and the lagoons that we just saw are disappearing. They are like, we are at risk of not having it anymore protecting Venice. It's not climate change that's making them disappear. It's the wrong economic choices by the city. It's erosion that's taking them away. And the erosion is associated with uncontrolled water traffic and large ships. Well, wow, that's very interesting because it's not a natural connection. Very interesting. Thank you. And, and, and David, as you're leading a, a very important uh, cultural heritage preservation project in, 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 in Venice, can you tell us, I'm sure you're confronted every day with the challenges that we are talking about, you know, especially the impact of floods on the built heritage itself, but also the impact on, of our tourism. So can you tell us from a very practical point of view, how this is impacted the built uh, heritage on which you are working right now? Well, I can tell you that on the 12th of November, 2019, that you mentioned before, um, I was in my house, in my office on the ground floor of my house, which is on the Canal Grande, and I had water up to my belt. So everything below it, and I had never realized that until that day, everything is below it. Tables, uh, filing cabinets, obviously uh, lots of your library. I lost 1,800 books on that day. is below it. So it, it has an, an enormous impact on the life of people. But just to give you a, 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 an answer to your question, a straight answer, Venice is obviously built in water and it is made of three components, made of wood, made of stone and made of bricks. The wood is what is under the houses. People often don't realize that, that houses are built on wood, uh, but wood piles, I, that is to say, very large uh, um, uh, trees that, at the time the house was built, 
were piled vertically, one next to another, one next to each other, and so closely that slowly the oxygen disappeared and they compacted and uh, fossilized. So they become like a huge uh, boulder on which the house can be built. On top of that, there is obviously some horizontal wood. And then on top of that, there is a special stone called Istrian stone that comes from across the Adriatic in what is now Slovenia. And there are um, um, quarries there that have been uh, providing this particular stone uh, for, for since the 14th century. And what is important about this stone is that it is not affected by the salinity of the water. So it's impermeable to the salt, and that is fundamental to its use in Venice. Above that, there are the bricks, and the houses are made of bricks, and then they may be covered with plaster and, uh, and, and so on, but fundamentally they are made of bricks on top of the wood and on top of the stone. What happens when the water rises, as long as it touches the stone, nothing happens, because as I said, the stone is not impacted by the salinity of the water. But as soon as the water reaches the bricks, then the bricks, by osmosis, the bricks start sucking up the water and it seeps into the bricks. And if it were only water, for instance, if Venice was in the middle of the lake, nothing much would happen. We'd have some humidity in the houses and that was it. But because of the salt, the water keeps the salt into the bricks and the salt fragment the bricks and, and erode the bricks and the bricks uh, crumble, like they really crumble. And that is why, uh, the buildings of Venice are suffering. They're suffering because as the water keeps going up, whereas, say, a century ago, there was from time to time a great tide that would go above the, the stones, and then there would be time for, it to, for the walls to dry up. Now, it happens so often that the wall never dries up. I mean, San Marco, which is in the lowest place in Venice, um, it gets um, soaked every time the water goes up, but not much lower than the level at which the Mose is activated. So San Marco is practically sitting in water all the time. And so, and the water goes up the walls very slowly, but very surely. And now they have seen that at the level of the mosaics, which we think of in the top, in the vaults of San Marco, at the top there, the water has come up and the salt is coming up and the, and the tiles, little tiles of the mosaics are coming off. So the impact is huge, and I see it in the project of the synagogues that uh, you and I mentioned before. Um, the synagogues obviously are built on the water because on one side they're built between the square and the canal, and the canal goes around the three synagogues that I am concerned with. And, um, and what ha has happened there is that, whereas on, in St. Mark Square, in even my house, um, a lot of money was spent when the houses were or St. Mark were, were built because they were important buildings. Um, the synagogues were built by very poor people who were coming as refugees from persecution somewhere in, in, in Europe. And they arrived with very little money, and, but they wanted to have a, a, a synagogue. So on top of their very, very small and low flats, uh, their apartments, they, they built the synagogue. But they had little money, so they saved on everything. And the, the effect of that is that now the structure of these buildings is completely impaired. So the, the part on the, on the square is quite solid because it's dry. The part on the canal is very wet all the time because also of the rising seas. Um, and uh, because they use li as little stone as they could because stone was much more expensive than bricks. And, um, and now there is a big change of level between one and the other. And you can see it in the floor, there is an, a, 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 um, a dislivello, how do you say, um, a change of level of something like 25 centimeters from one and the other, which means that the enormous cracks are developing. It means that we can't let people in to visit the places, the synagogues, because if you have more than 30 people, the whole thing risks coming down to the floor below. And so it has an enormous impact on daily life. And that's what we are trying now to restore the synagogues and make sure that we minimize the impact of, of, the, 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 of the salinity of the water. There are not many ways of doing that, unfortunately. Um, there are some ways that have been used, but I, I must say, just as a small glimmer of hope, uh, that yesterday I had a long meeting with a scientist 
who has developed um, um, what seems to be the answer. Uh, I don't know how good it will be, but a, a system of impregnating the walls with a nano, nano um, uh, layer of, uh, of glass. And, uh, and what that makes, it, it uh, stops the water, it stops the, not the water, it stops the salt getting into the, the, the bricks the stone, anything. And uh, he's done an experiment with one building, which is in between two canals. And last year on one side, he did nothing. And on the other side, he covered the, all, the, all the part underwater and up to the first floor with this system. And um, he's, he, he was going to show the results of the yesterday afternoon, I couldn't go, but I will, uh, I will uh, let you know more about it. But apparently, uh, thank you. No, it's complete, completely dry. No, but thank so. you, David. It's it's a perfect illustration on at the same time the urgency of the problem. I think, like uh, showing like how all the buildings and extraordinary heritage in Venice is impacted by these floodings, and at the same time the excitement, in fact, of cultural heritage preservation, where we always are in search of new solutions. So hopefully the one you're talking about will not disappoint us. But before we really turn to, to solutions, because you, you've set the stage so well, I would like to give the floor to Thomas as an artist. Uh, in the uh, 2019 Venice Biennale, you had this sound piece really interacting with the challenges of Venice. So can you, can you talk to us about, about this piece called Aqua Alta and Clave del Sol and that we will play at the end of this event. So you have to stay until the end because it's such an intriguing piece that you will all want to listen to it. But how does this piece reflect your understanding, Thomas, of the future of Venice and, and, and the challenges associated with it? Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you for so beautiful. If we want to put up the slides, then we can also try to look at some images that we, we have been uh, prepared. And the next one, if it's possible, please. At least we all know when the, the water comes up, and we have just been reading by David. Uh, as he mentioned, the next one, please. And, uh, and all these passarellas that are built uh, while the silver. Uh, um, it rise in the next one, please. And then, I mean, Venice, what I was very taken, I mean, I, I, I was living in Italy for 12 years in Udine, not so far from Venice, and my family was going to visit the, the city. What was lately, I was taken by this alarm system, no? And Venice have uh, all these sirens or big speakers, places in different places, 16 of them, as far as I know. And this means what it does, if we go to the next slide, these are the location of the alarm sisters. And if we play, for example, 130, when the sea level rise at a different, uh, every 10 centimeter, uh, there's a difference. Thomas, we lost your sound because of the alarm system that was played. No. Uh, to, Thomas, do you hear us? Uh -oh, the alarm system has created a problem. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to... Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I think there is, there is a sound problem, maybe because of the alarm. Maybe you can uh, leave and rejoin. And in the meantime, I will, uh, I will talk with David about this five-point plan. And as soon as you rejoin, we will go back to your, uh, to your sound piece. Um, yeah, so, so, so David, like, uh, as, as mentioned before, you published a, a five-point plan back in September. And I, I, I was really taken by it because I think all of us, we feel like, oh, Venice is doomed, but we don't know what to do. And what was great in your five-point plan is that you really gave very concrete measures of what can be done to save Venice. And uh, I thought it was uh, very interesting on the tourism side of things. You, you were saying that we really need to take measures to avoid day trippers. Um, also, you proposed building a marina. So, I mean, this raises many questions. First, is this doable? 
uh, how many people, how do you measure how many people is too many people in Venice? And, and, and does that mean also that only the wealthy will go to Venice? Well, there are many complex questions to answer, <laughs> but um, I'll try to give you uh, some ideas. Um, how many people? Um, we don't know how many people. And one of the points I made in my five point speech, by the way, were the, indeed published by the art newspaper, but I had not uh, meant them to be an article in the art newspaper. I meant them to be, and they were published as an open letter to the candidates for mayor of Venice. And uh, there were two candidates and, uh, and uh, I said, this are, these are the problems of Venice, how you're going to address it and to address them. And obviously I had said absolutely nothing from the man who everybody knew was going to be elected and has been duly elected, who is not so concerned about these issues as we are. Um, but as, as for tourists, um, we don't know how many can, can fit in Venice. We know there are too many. You mentioned 20 million, some other people mentioned 30 million of visitors a year. And, um, and it's going to increase all the time. I mean, there's no way with, for instance, China now, flourishing again and uh, being over COVID and so on. Um, Chinese tourists were in an enormous amount of people coming to Venice. The, the, boat, the boats, you mentioned five, six boats a week. Actually, there were five, six boats a day, which is quite a different matter. And, uh, and so um, it's, there were too many people. That's what we knew. We knew we had to queue to go to the next square. I mean, we living in Venice had to queue to get to the next square because there were, you know, in Venice there are a lot of roads, Cali, that are very narrow and but that can take three or four people on each side, but that is not enough. So what I proposed is that there should be a commission to study the problem and to see how we can address it. How many people can Venice take? A commission, independent people, um, scientists who will study and work out how many people can take. Can Venice take 27,000 people a day? Can it take 37,000 people a day? Can it take 12,000 people a day? I'll show you, a, just to give you an idea, a little map, which I, I steal from somebody else's work. This is worked out, the, the red dots are produced by um, a bleep from a telephone, from a mobile phone. And this is what happens in Venice. You can see that the people arrive in um, here, they arrive in, in here in Piazzale Roma, which by car, from this is the bridge, or they come by train and they arrive at the station. And then they go to Strada Nuova, which is the main route to come to Venice, and they, they go all over the city. And this happens at uh, between eight, as you see, eight and 12 o'clock in the morning. And that is on a normal day. You take a day of a holiday day, a Saturday or Sunday, any Saturday or Sunday, between 12 and four, and this is what happens. In this area, which is between Rialto and San Marco, there are millions of people and they all go there and they all want to have the place in the sun. And, um, and that is what makes clogs up the city. So we need to fix how many people can stay in that area and say, okay, 27,000 people can come to Venice every day. So there will be a system, very easy to implement, a system, in which you have to book yourself and it's going to be free. So it's totally democratic. It's just a question of organizing yourself. Up to 27,000 people, first come, first serve, you book your place and then you can come to Venice and have a much better experience than more people have now. If you, if you can't buy a boat and don't fit in the 27,000, I'm sorry, you have to go and do uh, some, something else. And in fact, to tell you the truth, 60% 60, 60 of the people who come by boat prefer to go to an outlet, which is about 20 miles from Venice, than to go into Venice itself. And, and I see many people in the chat are asking like about those gigantic cruise ships. So would you forbid them altogether? Yes, definitely. Well, I certainly would forbid them from coming into the lagoon. I think they don't belong in the lagoon. The, the lagoon was never kind of, it was never thought that navigation lagoon would be for those kind of boats. It would be, they were much, much smaller and they were made for traveling both in the Adriatic and the rest of the Mediterranean and the lagoon. But these ships are made for traveling across the Atlantic and close to the Pacific and they're not meant for Venice. They are 
they're completely out of place. And also the people on them stay here for a few hours. They sleep on the boat, on the ship. They eat on the ship. They go out with a package prepared by the ship and they are given a little bag with the, the sandwiches, the water and everything, which goes is part of the rental of the room. I mean, part of the cost of the trip. And then they come into Venice, they go around desperate, looking desperate, hot or cold or whatever, and, and looking constantly out their mobile phone to see whether they got a message from their friends. And uh, they never look around. You can see them very rarely look around. And they really don't understand the city. And what they do, they eat, they drink, they leave their rubbish behind, and they go back to the boat. And so for you, it should be a political, because I see many people say, oh, can it be banned? But yes, it's a political decision. Right? Yeah, it can be banned. I mean, there are, there are uh, ways of doing it. I, mean, I have nothing against the ship of, uh, ships, obviously, and I would build a port in the Adriatic, and people can come there, and then they can take normal boats, Venetian boats, to come into the city, if they really want to come into the city, rather than go to the, to the outlet. That's fine, but they have to travel like Venetians, not come in like, like a, 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 a like an invasion, because it's not right. Uh, they, thank you. That's no. very clear. I really want to go back to Thomas now. I think Thomas, can you speak? Do we, yes. we have can yes, perfect. So yes. I really want you to give you the occasion to present your your your, your piece. Yes. So let's go back to your uh, image. And we won't play the sirens because apparently it's not only a siren for Venice, but also for our, for our event. <laughs> so. yeah. No, but uh, I mean, uh, and and I think so. Uh, many can can know better than me. But uh, if we go back just to the other slide, just before coming here, yes, I mean there are uh, you know Venetian. They know exactly for each ten centimeter, the tone and the sound is different. I mean, there is a, an alarm uh, which it plays, and we will not play, not play it now, but it's for 110 centimeters. And there is another tone for 120, 130, 140, and so forth. This means the artwork, which I thought, is like a, what will be the tone in 100 years, right? I mean, in 100 years, what, what, you know, what, what alarm we should be hearing when the sea level rises much more than 140 centimeters? has been... When we think about, I mean, and, and this was the art, you know, it was, was really kind of then the, the, the composition of, of, of that sound piece. Now, and that kind of the particularity, then I start to think about like, okay, uh, for who I'm playing this alarm system, right? Has been, we know <laughs> if we kind of move away from the human exceptionalism that we are the center of the world and we continue with this arrogant arrogancy, uh, somehow you can think that there are many living system, among them animals, and we have been talking about the dolphins today, that can hear other frequencies. Uh, sometimes are infrasound, which are very, very, very low, or sometimes are very, very high. We know, for example, that dogs can hear things that we never hear. Has mean the sound composition, it starts to, from one side also plays a lot of, I mean, if we move up to the images, uh, I can show you also how we built the, the sound. These were the, the where the piece was playing, there were four loudspeakers uh, that were playing, seeing this new uh, composition. The next one, please. And the next one, please. Yes, here we are with a hydrophone. It's a, high, it's a microphone which is worked under the water. And we record all also what thinking about this composition, about what we can hear. This means when this gigantic boat that you have been talking come to the lagoon, I hear them from here, from very far away. This means, you know, sound under the water, they travel at the speed much more high what it traveled today in the air. And if we go to the next one also. Yeah, and this means we kind of play a little bit with this tide. No? And the next one, please. And here is the microphone coming up, uh, up of the water. I don't know. Hey, you, now you can scroll with the image and do whatever you, you feel. Now, a little bit to the to, to coming back, and because I read today, David, and I, I love the, all the conversation you have and Judith and, and all the ideas that you've been speaking. Now, for me, something which was very particular about this, maybe we leave it there, uh, please, the image, is this idea of this transversal uh, work, no? I mean, the idea is really like, can we place that piece with this alarm system uh, that exists in Venice? As it seems a little bit, if we start to connect and think, uh, 
you know, during the pandemic, we have turned into a digital world, right? And as much as we can control ships, it seems there is another level, uh, as we have been thinking, which is quite addictive, which is our mobile phone. And David very simply said, people sometimes come, they are so addicted to a certain information. And today also you touch it very good. We said, oh, was fake news or not fake news, the dolphin on Venice, right? I mean, what I'm proposing here, and I think so I can add maybe to David and, and, and Judith, no, uh, that, that uh, we were talking, uh, and Jane, Jane, sorry, Jane, uh, at, at the conversation today, is how much we can control the digital sphere. Because it, it seems that a lot of our time, we are spending it hearing or listening, not only sirens, which go, somehow are managed to go across scales, uh, but do you understand what I'm proposing? It's thinking, can we think about an infosphere or somehow to regulate what today uh, we consume in our mobile phone? This mean, in the moment that we understand uh, or, or how much fake news today or stories which are not true guide us, very simple, to places or not. I mean, I think so, you know, I would actually tend to just drop it because it was an idea in the morning saying, can the people arriving to Venice have a digital network which is controlled, not by big multinational, Google, Facebook, and so forth, who knows nothing about Venice and who have very, very limited understanding of the life where they're, but nevertheless, make us move and decide what we do and what we visit due to a very you know, let's say not call it Anthropocene, but capital scene, which is this kind of yeah, collapse that we are all living. I mean, what I'm thinking really, I think so we need to start to control here. And when we control this one, the information that we are sharing, what to visit when, and, and I think so David and Jane, you know, we can post uh, amazing news. We can say, well, uh, I don't know. I know that David doesn't like uh, going with Kaya, but we can say, okay, but there is one day or there's one hour and we got the message and we say, look, uh, or oh, the gondola, right? But we can kind of promote mobility. So we can promote activities which are in tune and sensible to life on the lagoon, not only of humans, but also of other animals and other species. But I really think that once we get hold of that, I think so we can change what a monument could be also. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, you're very eloquent also on the role of the artist who thinks differently than all of us. And, and thank you so for being so creative. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure everyone will enjoy the sound piece because you use the sirens as your instrument, which is uh, quite interesting as a way to raise awareness about the challenges of Venice. Jane, I, I want really to turn to you because you're leading this uh, citizen initiative. And, and many people I see in the chat are like, okay, but what can we do if we are not a scientist? You know, a few weeks ago, you told me, oh, but you know, there is nothing natural in Venice. It's all the product of interaction between humans and nature. Okay, so what can we humans of today do when we go to Venice? Because we feel guilty. So, so tell us. How can we travel to Venice in a responsible manner? We cannot hear you. Jane, you have to unmute yourself. I think she's no, unmuted, yeah. but there was, a, there was a problem. So I think it's every time with the PowerPoint, there is a problem. Anyway, David, we hear you. So do you have ideas of what current tourists uh, yes, can I also, can I also um, what uh, something Thomas has said, which I thought was very inspiring. Um, I thought we should use those sirens to to guide people when they come to Venice on their phone, so that if they go in the wrong direction, in the sense that they go to a very crowded place, they'll be the first level of sound. If they go to a very very crowded place, it'll be a higher level of sound. If they want to go to some marked place. <laughs> there will be a, such a sound that they will not be able to, to go there. <laughs> and uh, it will be too, so it will guide them to, I mean, Venice is, is uh, full of beautiful areas that are not visited by tourists at all. And they are equally beautiful as the places where people go, as Rialto or St. Mark Square. And you, the whole of Canareggio, Santa Croce, Castello, they are beautiful, Dosso Duro. You don't need to go to 
uh, to the main square of Venice in order to enjoy the city. So if you had the system to guide you, um, then, then... But, but David, David, the system is in your hand. Today, no, no, people no. look all the time, right? And this means it's like, a, I mean, and I'm not afraid to start to think that, uh, you know... Before, yes. Can I just jump in? <laughs> yes, yes, please, Jane. <laughs> Before getting very technological, I think one point needs to be made right now. And I think that the, the problem with Venice is the very tiny resident population. When I visit New York, I quickly get that New York pace because it's so filled with local people, you behave like they behave. And Venice, by losing its local population, is, lo is losing its indigenous knowledge that can guide people in what they, what they do. And, and I think that digital tools may be helpful, but in order to save the city, we need at least 10,000 new residents so that as the visitors arrive in Venice, they see what we're doing and they get, get, this, they, they get the impulses of the things they can do from us. They see me walking off to get the boat to go to the lagoon. They can follow me and come with me. But so now how do you make that happen? Venice, you see mass tourists and you see them sitting on steps eating pizza slices. You don't, you don't get the signals of the sense of place anymore. Yeah. No, so Jane, how do you get? How, to, uh, sorry, I would like I would like uh, Jane to elaborate a little bit more. So, how yeah. do you make that happen? How do we get more residents in Venice instead of having them leave? Well, I think I believe that it's as I've said before that to get more residents in Venice, we need to completely change our. our consideration of what makes Venice, Venice. And I think that developing the lagoon as being more integral to the life of the city, we can attract more people and provide even jobs in ecosystem scale restoration of the lagoon system. We're working on it and we're finding ways of doing it. Of course, it's not simple. It, the lagoon isn't mine. The lagoon isn't yours. The lagoon belongs to the, the nation. It, it's offices in Rome that decide who can do what in the lagoon, that regulate what happens to the port. So we have some very serious governance issues. But the international community can help us have our voice. I don't know if this isn't something I was planning to say now, but there are times where people who live in Venice really feel terribly repressed and ignored. We don't have, we don't get our voice listened to. And the international community can help magnify what the Venetians think and know and can do. We have a, I have a motto that says, Venice for the Venetians, Venice for the world. And um, I believe that uh, with a resilient population and respect for local knowledge, Venice will be able to save itself and be a laboratory for innovative approaches to community resilience and sustainable development. It's like a microcosm in which to develop and showcase global solutions. We're all addressing the same issues what to do about sea level rise, affordable housing, salts infiltration on building maintenance. These aren't purely Venetian issues. The tensions between traditions and consumerism and over tourism. We're working hard to find a way through for everybody. And I must say that, that as I say this, I get a terrible lump in my throat. I have four children, and I worry about what their lives are going to be in the near future. We, you know, I even worry about what their lives are like now and how their lives have been this past year. And, but I do realize that for their prospects to be better, the prospects for everybody need to change. Everything is interconnected. 
you can't ignore for a minute longer the connection between the environment, the economy, health, humans and non-humans. It's just an inescapable truth. And everybody needs to play their part in keeping things together. Oh, th thank you, James. That's so eloquent. So I see, I see we have many, many questions in the chat. So I'm going to give each one and we have only a few minutes left. So I will give you each one of you one and then you can answer. So, uh, so, so Jane, some people ask, like, do you think uh, the problem of sea level rise will contribute to over tourism because people will rush to come to Venice before it disappears? And so what can tourists do? Because we have so many people uh, listening. I think they all want to know what they can do. I think, Thomas, the question for you, I will give you the floor one after the, the other, just for the sake of time. The question for you, for many people in the chat is, what art can do? Like, what can you do? Are you trying to do something through your art or you don't see it that way? And for David, some people are asking, how do you raise awareness about Jewish heritage in Venice without attracting too many tourists? and to them too, because you don't want to be them to be the victim. So let's go through the three of you, each one with your question, because we have a few minutes left. So uh, maybe Jane first. I like, I don't like the word tourists. I like to think of people as visitors and they can behave in, they can just make good decisions about where they go, what they do, what they eat, what they buy, and that way, by coming to Venice, they can act like temporary residents. And I want to say quickly that I don't know if anybody's noticed my earrings, but the other day I found myself being a resident visitor because <laughs> for the first time, because of this empty Venice, I stopped to look in the windows of a souvenir shop at the Rialto and I started talking to the, the man selling this wonderful beadwork. I mean, I hope everybody likes them. And I, you know, in 25 years, I've never stopped at that shop. It's like, you know, right near my house. And talking to this man, we had, we had the same ideas about everything, even though nobody would have expected us to be on, on this, the same, wavelength because our occupations are at opposite ends of the spectrum. And I just think it's a, it's a question of knowledge and respect, cooperation and communication. It, it's caring for Venice by the Venetians and the people coming to Venice caring for the place where they choose to spend their holiday. Uh, thank you. I, I love your answer. It's like telling tourists you have to behave like residents. So please go and buy things from real Venetian, pay attention, stay more than one day, do things that residents would do. Wonderful. And I love your earrings, by the way. I hope to visit you one day and to buy some. Okay, maybe, uh, uh, maybe um, David, do you want to answer quickly on the question on how to raise awareness about the Jewish heritage of Venice, but without threatening it? But plant the whole discussion to, to the Jewish question as well. Um, what I want to say, what we need is quality, not quantity. We need uh, tourists of, of quality, not the quantity. Everybody who is watching us at this very minute, I'm sure would be most more than welcome to Venice. You have no, com no um, problem about coming here. You're most welcome because the very fact that you're watching us means that you're, you care. Um, but what we want is increase the level of quality. And that applies not only to tourists, but applies to the citizens of Venice, to the residents of Venice. My Two of my points were increase, make Venice the capital of culture of Europe. And that means bringing into Venice art on a grand scale, artists on a grand scale, musicians, singers, um, art painters and sculptors and so on. Every form of art should be welcome in Venice. We, can, we have palaces galore, we have places amazing that were built in order to have concerts and lectures and so on. And let's have them, instead of let them die at five o'clock in the afternoon, let them come to life at five o'clock in the afternoon. Let's have places where people can go in the evening. Now in the evening in Venice, there's nothing to be done. There's nothing, everything is dead after, after dinner. And let's bring it back to, the, to, to what it was in the 18th century. 
we know how to do it. It's just a question of now with the means of communication we have, it's very easy to do. The other point is make Venice the capital of sustainability, as has been mentioned more than once. Get all the great um, 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 NGOs in the world that are devoted to global warming, pollution, and so on, to come and put their offices where they're most needed. Let's make Venice a laboratory for sustainability. Let's make sure that everybody who is interested in sustainability puts their wellness on and comes to Venice, to live in Venice. And let me be clear that Venice is the most beautiful place in the world to live in, particularly for children. If you have children, Venice is a, a paradise. There are no cars, no motorbikes. No, you can walk around, it's healthy, it's unpolluted, it's, except when the boats are around. And uh, it's, it's, uh, you are in the middle of nature or, or, and you walk everywhere. It couldn't be a healthier place for children to come up. My children were, were brought up in Venice my latest ones. And uh, so it's a question of raising, and if we have more people living in Venice, then we have the effect that Jane was mentioned. More tourists will realize that that's the way you do it in Venice. You don't just go around in columns of, of two in, in 150 people with some stuff in their ears and just looking at their mobile phones. You have to go around and, and lose yourself and enjoy the city and see what the Venetians are doing and buy the tomatoes and and uh, and and go and have their shoes your shoes mended. But if we don't get more residents and by having culture and and this kind of citadel of sustainability, we'll get many more people living here and the level of the city will go up and the level of the tourists will go up. Thank you, David. And that's a perfect segue to that, Thomas. So Thomas, David is talking about having Venice as a cultural capital and bringing more artists. But you as an artist, what is your point of view on that? Is it realistic like to have this idea of Venice, this artistic capital of Europe for not one day, but every day of the year, having much, like much more tour, uh, artists living in Venice? What is your point of view on that? But I, th I, I think so all ideas that Jane has placed, that David is placing, that you are talking, Benedict, are brilliant. The problem is they're not getting to the audience or to the people. And this is why I keep insisting, and sorry, I read in the chat, and I think so, what I've been talking is misleading somehow because it seems that I want to design another app to just guide tourists or having sound being directed where people should go. Let's think about, because I think so, what, I, what is missing today is like the lack of imagination that sometimes what is mostly controlling our lives can also be uh, used differently. Let's put it that way. There are many places that is a no Wi-Fi zone. Okay, let's imagine now everybody who is hearing now. Let's say when we enter Venice, there is no any more internet and there is no more mobile phone connection. Think about that. Think about that is an art project. It's my artistic intervention. What it happened when you don't have a mobile phone anymore, if we cannot control it, because by the chat that I see, people are saying, I... It's not the design of the app. It's just saying, look, I have, there is a control in certain information that you deliver. Well, let's say there is no Wi-Fi. What do you do when you need to find an address? You ask a Venetian and he tell you, oh, turn left, turn right. You start to spot the quality of the water. You look at the clouds because you have more time. And see, what I'm trying to say today, there's a huge discrepancy between how our life somehow I guided by Google Maps and we fall in the canals because we don't know where we are looking, and the information that is worthy being accessible and need to be shared and spread. Like what Jane is saying and David is saying. But I mean, I know I'm at the edge of the generation, but what I'm saying, you know, when you put all your plans, David and Jane, let's fight for let's ser ser certain kind of freedom because the internet is not freedom, it's the antithesis. Here is controlled by purely economical interest of the digital sphere. And we have to fight for that. Once we get hold back and recognize something here, we might also address maybe, and maybe forget about it. No, let's say no internet on Venice for a week. I tell you, tourists will change completely and radically, just as an idea. Thank you. What I love is that the three of you have great ideas, very ambitious one. And, 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 and I see a lot of uh, uh, comments in the chat that it's all about politics and it's true. But I think if the civil society doesn't propose ambitious 
ambitious measures and nothing will move. And it's also like, uh, yes, this morning, some ideas were published, which is really interesting by the cities of Florence and, uh, and Venice to have a better quality tourism. What's interesting is to see that things are moving, that people are taking advantage of the pandemic to think and, and, and to realize that it cannot start like before. So I, I think all of those people who are concerned should, should, should dare, just dare like Thomas just did like David did by publishing his article, like Jen is doing every day. They are pushing ideas, sometimes idealistic ideas, but without that, nothing will ever happen. So, uh, I mean, this is a very uh, constructive discussion, lots of ideas. What we are going to do, because there was so much work done on this, is that we're going to publish on the page of our event, like a, a lot of work, interesting work that has been published. Well, Monuments Fund has been very active in advocating against the cruise ship. So you will see that report. Uh, but uh, everybody on this panel have done some amazing work as well. And so we're going to publish some resources because a lot of uh, extensive work has been done in the past. But I think the important thing is that all of us raise our voice because things can change. As, as we can see, things are moving right now and we should keep up our ambitions. So on that world, I invite you all to uh, check our website, wmf.org, to follow us and to see our next events. I want to thank our panelists. They are fantastic. I can't wait to meet with the three of you in person. And I will leave you with the extraordinary song piece by Thomas Saraceno. And thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.